thousand of them every single day. And if we went on a vegetarian diet collectively, that would not happen with that kind of frequency. Well, at this point, the audience is booing. <laughs> and they're, you know, they're just really giving me a hard time. And I, I finally just had to say, look, you guys, you can heckle me as much as you want to. But this process of atherosclerosis, this hardening of the arteries that comes from a lifetime of eating beef and other high-fat foods, it doesn't just cause heart attacks. It can also make you impotent. And I had their complete attention for the rest of my lecture. Now, see, I wasn't making this up. By age 60, one in four American men is impotent. And it's not performance anxiety when you're 60. It's, you see, the, the coronary arteries that go to the heart muscle, if they get artery blockages, uh, you don't get blood and oxygen to the, to the heart anymore, and a portion of the heart muscle dies. That's a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. If you block the arteries to the brain, you get a stroke or a death of the portion of the brain that that artery was leading to. If you block the arteries to any vital organ, are you, are you with me? Okay, all right. You see, see, the male sexual anatomy is this peculiar hydraulic system that it was obviously devised on a Monday because everything goes wrong with it, but you need a good vigorous blood supply in order for it to, to um, function properly. So anyway, by the way, this is no joke for cardiologists. They know a man in his 50s who develops impotence has a one in four risk of heart attack or stroke within two years. It's just a sign of blocked arteries. So anyway, at the end of my lecture in Lubbock, I had all these guys in snakeskin boots coming up to the front, asking me for my macho tofu recipes and power brown rice. <laughs> I realized I should stop talking about heart attacks because that doesn't motivate people, but we figured out what does. So now I want to give you a little bit of bad news and I want your help. The American Cancer Society is a huge nonprofit organization and their development department has apparently not figured out what their nutritional scientists know. They're sponsoring an event in Atlanta called the Cattle Baron's Ball, which is, has as its principal uh, coordinators the owners of the Buckhead Beef Company. And these are phenomenally wealthy people in Atlanta, and they're trying to raise money for cancer. Now, cancer researchers, if there's one thing that is really clear, it's that individuals who eat a lot of beef have more colon cancer, probably 300% more than other people. Saturated fat is linked to breast cancer, so why is the American Cancer Society doing this? Well, it's not just doing it in Atlanta. They're doing it out here. They're doing them all around the country, having people dress up in cowboy attire and go in, and they are served ribs. And they then give money, and you know where the money goes? We're afraid of telling the truth about cancer. We say, get your mammogram, get screened, so that we find it. Now, I want to find cancer if it's there, but I don't want it to be there. Or let's raise money for better treatments. Well, if you've got it, let's treat it. But there's a third step, and that's to prevent it from happening, and that is never going to happen if we don't separate ourselves from the things that cause it. Now, I know that you all know this, but we want, when you get to have a big charity like this, they're afraid of telling the truth. They're willing to beat up on tobacco now because everybody else is. But what we have to say is that we should not have the meat-based diet that we have in America if we ever intend to tackle cancer. So, I've, just this morning, I was on the phone with the chief scientists at the American Cancer Society saying you have to cancel this event or you have to re-theme it. Uh, they were going further. They were actually planning to run live cattle through the streets of Atlanta as a promotional PR stunt, and they're having pig races at, uh, at the event to try to make people get into this theme about agriculture is your friend and so forth, and it's complete nonsense. It has to be stopped. Would you do me a favor? Would you write down that number on your screen? And would you please call them and say, please don't do this. Let's get serious. We have to do what we can to stop cancer. Um, or else, at the end of my presentation tonight, I'm going to give our website, PCRM's website, Click on there. I'll give you all the details there as well, okay? I am quite convinced that if... Thank you. They mean well. They just need to hear this message. And if we work together, we can get them to do the right thing too. Okay. Let's say I want to break free. I'm convinced I'm ready to change my own diet. Well, what do we do? What I suggest you do is we're going to take a three-week period, and during this period of time, we're going to start with a healthy breakfast. Why? Because if your breakfast is really high in fiber, it keeps you full during the morning, so you're less likely to fall prey to the donut tray that is walking by work at about 10.30 that morning. Now, when I was a kid growing up in Fargo, North Dakota, my mom cooked us different kinds of breakfast. The typical thing was her five kids would get out of bed, and we'd go down to the kitchen, and my mother would take 
a fork and she would pull hot sizzling bacon strips out of the frying pan and put them on the paper towel to drain. And when the bacon was all out of the frying pan, she would carefully pick up that hot pan and tip it over to pour the grease into a jar. And she would take that jar of bacon grease and she didn't stick it in the refrigerator, she put it on the shelf. Now why don't you have to refrigerate bacon grease? Because when it cools down, what happens? It solidifies. That is a sign it's loaded with saturated fat. That's the stuff that increases your cholesterol level, leading to heart attacks. So the next day, my mother would take that jar off the shelf, and she'd spoon it, the grease back in the pan and fry eggs in it for her kids. And it's amazing that any of us live to adulthood, as I reflect on it now. <laughs> Problem was, that's a very seductive meal at the time, but there's no fiber in it. Eggs don't have fiber. Fiber means plant roughage. So at 10 o'clock in the morning, her kids were all hungry again. Well, you're a growing boy. You ought to have a good appetite. You ought to be hungry. Wait a minute. If you give that same kid a big bowl of old-fashioned oatmeal that's high in fiber with cinnamon and raisins and some sliced strawberries, they're not hungry, and you can measure how much they snack. It's noticeably less later in the day. You give them a high-fiber lunch, same story. Okay. Secondly, you want to choose foods that keep your blood sugar steady. I'm thinking of the bean group, beans, peas, lentils, green leafy vegetables. Fruits are okay. Pasta is actually okay. A lot of folks are afraid of pasta, but if you measure a person's blood sugar, it does not spike and fall the way something like white bread may cause it to do. Uh, for dieters, some dieters shoot themselves in the foot by eating too little. If you don't eat enough food, you binge later. So use the rule of 10. All this is is you take your ideal body weight, multiply by 10, and the number that gives you is your calorie minimum. So like for me, let's say I should weigh 150 pounds times 10, that's what? 1,500. I can eat more calories than that, but I should never eat less than that because if I do, I'm definitely set up for a binge. I'm a bigger guy. I should weigh 200 pounds. I need at least 2,000 calories if I ever go, if I'm ever restricting and dieting and counting every last calorie, never go below your rule of 10. Better off, you really don't have to count calories at all if you're on a healthy, low-fat, vegan diet. Now, craving cycles... If every day about 4 o'clock you're plugging the quarters into the candy machine, or every night at 8 o'clock your refrigerator is magnetic, you need to forget about food. You need to focus on time from about an hour before to an hour after your time vulnerability period. Do something that is inconsistent with eating. Go for a walk, go to the gym, go to the movies, if somebody will escort you past the concession. And what you'll find is in a couple of weeks, foods never scream out at you to quite that degree. If you're a young woman and you have a monthly cycle where chocolate screams out at you at that special time of the month, we did a study a couple of years ago where we used a low-fat, vegan, high-fiber diet in a group of 33 young women as a means of tackling menstrual pain. And all it does is very low-fat foods reduce the amount of estrogen in the blood so that you don't have these ups and downs of estrogen. At the, at the end of the month, the hormone shifts are not so pronounced. Cramps are reduced. PMS is reduced. Cravings are reduced. Unless you had a double bacon cheeseburger any time in the month, in which case there's enough fat to increase the estrogen production right back up and you run into problems at the end of the month. Okay, um, exercise and rest. A lot of us really don't exercise much during the day. And as a result, when we lie down to sleep, our brains are kind of wired, but our bodies aren't really fatigued, so we don't sleep very soundly. But if you look at kids, you know, kids run around all day, and they lie down to sleep, and they're like comatose. Well, if you get some more exercise in your routine, go to bed just 10 minutes early. What you find is you wake up the next day with a little bit better uh, resolve against the cravings that might come by. So if you put all, the, all of these things together, you start with a healthy breakfast, you're eating an adequate amount of food, you're holding your blood sugar steady, and you feel well-rested. The cravings just don't matter to you so much. But there's two other things that I think are important to do. One is don't do it alone. Grab somebody else and say, you know, we are cheese addicts. Let's go together to the Betty Ford Cheese Clinic, and we're going to get fixed. Um, social support really matters. And also, other motivators. If I'm telling an 18-year-old kid, that he should avoid dairy products, and if he does, he won't get prostate cancer. He just stares at me blankly. An 18-year-old young man, he doesn't have a prostate. <laughs> or, well, if he does, he doesn't know where it is.